Hi everyone, it's Stella and Taryn from Maple University. Taryn will be teaching you how to play Stardew Valley, the board game, a game close to our heart because we play together so many, many hours. Isn't that right? Indeed, the uh, Stardew Valley video game really got us through the pandemic. This game is by Eric Barone and Cole Madaris and published by Concerned Ape. Let's get to the game. Based on the sandbox video game, Stardew Valley the board game is a cooperative game in which players try to earn their living on Grandpa's old farm and to enrich the lives and culture of Pelican Town. Over 16 rounds of play, players will need to work efficiently to farm, fish, forage, go mining and befriend the locals. All to obtain the money and resources needed to donate in six bundles to the town's ailing community centre and to achieve the four goals set down by Grandpa when he gave you the farm. If you can achieve these ten objectives and quell the cold corporate interests of the Joja Corporation, you'll save the community and win the game. To set up, lay out the board. Organise the cards. These cards are Grandpa's goals and you'll deal out four of them face up into the top left of the board and return the rest to the box. These ones are the community centre bundles and you'll shuffle each deck separately and deal one card face down into its matching slot. Keep the rest of the cards nearby as they might be needed. To win the game you'll need to complete these four objectives which you can see and these six objectives which will be revealed through the game. The Mining Levels cards are placed in a face-up stack in ascending order. The Mining Maps cards are shuffled and one is flipped face-up. All of the Season cards are shuffled up and used to assemble the Season deck. This will be made up of four Spring cards followed by the End of Spring card, four Summer cards and the End of Summer, and so on through all of the seasons to winter. Unused cards are returned to the box and in your first game you may wish to use these standard season cards showing this icon in the bottom right corner. Set aside the starting tools and the profession upgrades, we'll use those in player setup and shuffle the rest of the decks face down. Next you'll need to sort out all of the game's collectible tiles. You can categorise the tiles by the icons in the top left corners. This for example is a crop, this is a forageable and so on. Most tiles are double sided. This is an artefact on one side and a mineral on the other. While this is a normal crop on one side and a high value crop on the other side. Your first step of organisation is to flip all of the tiles over until you find any that show a colour or a colour and a tree on the reverse. Separate them by their colours, there'll be a stack of each for each season, and then take the spring tiles and seed them face down onto the board, placing a forageable on each of the mushroom icons and a tree onto each of the tree stump icons. All of the double-sided minerals artefacts tiles are placed into the grey bag. All of the fish and trash tiles go into the blue bag. Then add five random tiles from the fish bag to the fish track. All remaining tiles can be sorted by type and kept in the organisation tray. This has places for crops, broken into spring, summer and autumn, animal products and mining products. These include bug meat and stone, and then reversible tiles which show an ore on one side and a geode on the other. As a starting crop, take a parsnip on its normal side and place it on the two slot of your farm. Set up the building tiles. You'll have four buildings you'll be able to construct during the game, and this will always include the coop and the barn, which you'll set up with their matching animals underneath them. Shuffle the other tiles and draw two at random, placing them nearby. Also shuffle face down the deck of Jojo tiles. Jojo is a corporate supermarket chain whose presence diminishes the community spirit of the town and they serve as the antagonist in the game. Nearby keep the six dice that will be used for resolving actions. Each face of the animal dice shows a different one of the game's six animals. And the Stardew dice have three faces showing hearts, 
two faces showing Junimos and one showing a star drop. Each player takes a player board and its matching profession deck, and one matching deck of starting tools stacked in ascending order. This sets your specialisations from the start of the game. Each season you'll gain an upgrade in your profession, which will make that type of action more powerful. And as you upgrade your starting tool through the game, you'll also make its action more powerful. You may want to consider diversifying between your tool and your profession. If you go for the same sorts of actions, you will be very specialised, to the detriment of another type of action. Choose a coloured pawn and place it in the farmhouse, leaving the purple pawn to the side. This represents a spouse if you marry one of the villagers during the game. Give the team a shared three gold. Choose a first player who takes the pet marker and flips it either to the cat or dog side, a choice made permanently. You're now ready to play. Stardew Valley the board game plays in 16 rounds, which are split into four seasons, and the progression of the game is tracked by the season deck. Each round begins by flipping the top season card and resolving any effects on the card. Second is planning, where players may make exchanges between themselves and choose a starting location for the round somewhere in town. Third is the actions phase. Each player takes one turn in clockwise turn order from the first player. And on their turn, they take an action at their location, optionally move and forage, take an action at their now current location, and then return to the farmhouse and take an end of turn effect. As such, you can effectively take up to four actions per turn. You'd then proceed to the next round. After every fourth round, you'll reach the end of your current season and the card you flip will give you the instructions for setting up for the next season. You win the game by completing all four of Grandpa's goals and by revealing and completing all six of the Community Center bundles. All goals scale in size based on the number of players in the game. Here, for example, in a four-player game, you would need to give up four minerals to complete this bundle. Achieve all of this before the end of winter, and you win. But if you draw the end of winter card, then you lose the game. Now we'll go through each phase in detail. First is the season card. You'll draw the card and then resolve each icon on the card going from top to bottom. The various icons are all explained in this box here. And I'm not going to explain all of them just yet. Some of them will make more sense as we start to understand the actions in the game. But there are three I'll describe now. The Pet Wanders is an effect which causes the first player marker to rotate one step clockwise. This is the only way this happens, otherwise the same player will be first player over multiple rounds. If a card has the draw an event card effect represented by this question mark, then draw and resolve the top card from the event deck. And if the card has a Jojo action, then draw and place the top tile from the Jojo deck. This will make one of your other actions weaker or more expensive, and you should put the tile nearby to that action to remind you. In some rounds, you'll draw a festival card, and there are none of these icons on such a card. You simply resolve the text effect before proceeding to the next phase. Second is the planning phase, and the first step of this is to make exchanges with other players. And so to understand this, let's first have a look at a player's inventory. On the left of your board, you'll have your upgradable starting tool, and you'll have spaces for your profession upgrades, which we will speak about later. None of these can be traded. On the right of your board, you have six inventory slots for collectible tiles, two inventory slots for item cards, and a separate unlimited inventory for epic items. It's all of these which may be traded with other players during this phase. You'll need to do this to manage the inventory of the players. You can only use items that you're holding, unless otherwise stated. And when you spend or give up tiles as one of your actions, you must have that tile in your inventory. Furthermore, if you plan to gain tiles on your turn, then you'll need space in your inventory. 
if you get an extra tile and you don't have enough space, then you'll either have to discard it or any one other tile. That makes planning all of this out in the planning phase key. These restrictions don't apply to money or hearts. When these are gained, they go into a common pool and any player can spend from that common pool at any time. To finish the planning phase, each player chooses a starting location for their pawn. That is, one of these seven clearings containing one or more of the action rectangles. Multiple players may share the same location. Third is the action phase. Each player will take one turn in turn order, and on that turn, takes one action at the current location, may optionally move along one of these white paths to an adjacent location and forage in an adjacent area to that path, then take a second action in their new location or in their old location if they chose not to move and forage, and then finally move back to the farmhouse and take one of the four end of turn effects. You will try to move and forage regularly, as this is the way that you collect these tiles from the board. When you forage a tree, you always cut it down to get wood, an important building material. When you forage a tile, you'll often find the fruits of the earth, which can have various effects after you collect. These forage tiles will grant you either an artifact or a mineral when you flip them up while foraging. Draw a random tile from the grey bag, flip it over to the appropriate side, and then put that in your inventory, discarding the forage tile. This is the process you'll follow for any effect which grants you an artifact or mineral. Now we'll go through all of the board's different actions. Do note, it's quite common that when you take an action, you'll be able to take it multiple times, that is, do it as many times as you can afford in a single action. And a big part of the game's puzzle is in using those actions most efficiently. As we explain these actions, we're first going to take you through everything which lets you gain, use, and sell resources. Only after we've gone through all of that, will we tell you how to cash them in at the community centre to complete the game-winning bundles. First we'll talk about the farming actions, and the first step of farming is to buy seeds from Pierre. Buy any number of crop tiles which match the current season at a cost of one coin per seed. And then plant them quality side down into the farm slot which matches the amount of water required for harvest. By default, there may only be one tile in each slot of the farm. But the player whose starting tool is the hoe will be able to start stacking more tiles on top of each other as the hoe is upgraded. Once you have crops in your farm, you can take the water the crops action, and when you do this, by default, all of the tiles in your farm are slid one step to the right. The player who starts with the watering can will be able to water more than one step at once, once that's upgraded. When a crop is watered off the end of the farm track, then it is harvested and goes to the inventory of the player who took the watering action. There are several season card effects which impact your farming. This icon represents a rainy day and automatically waters all crops one step. If this causes a harvest, then the harvested crop must go to the current starting player. If you draw the star, then one of your crops becomes high quality. Choose one and flip it over. It's now worth one more gold, and might be needed for some objectives or bundles. If you draw a crow icon, then a crow eats one of your planted crops. Crow icons can be green or red. And a green crow will eat from spaces 3, 2 or 1, a red crow from 3, 4 or 5. You choose which crop is eaten, and if there's none available of the right colour, then the crow eats nothing. So now, let's return to Pierre's shop. We've already seen how you buy seeds, but you can also sell things at Pierre's shop as part of the action. To do this, simply discard any number of tiles from your inventory and gain money equal to the costs in the lower right corners. It's important to note that you don't normally have to visit Pierre to sell things. 
when you're resolving any season card, if you reach the shipping bin icon, that is an immediate opportunity for all players to sell as much as they want. Gaining money in exactly the same way as if they'd sold to Pierre. But if you draw a season card which doesn't have this icon, or if you desperately need to sell something that you gained after the end of the season card, but before the end of the action phase, then Pierre's is an option. Either way, the full action when you visit Pierre's is to buy and plant as many seeds as you want and sell as much as you want from your inventory. The action when you visit Robin is to buy buildings and you can buy as many buildings as you can afford. Pay the building's cost in gold, wood and stone and then flip it face up into your farm. This is now available for all players to use. These have many effects, but most critical are the coop and the barn, as these are the buildings which unlock your ability to raise animals on the farm. To gain animals once they're unlocked, you must visit Marnie and take the buy animals action. Choose any number of animal tiles which you've unlocked, pay the cost in gold shown in the bottom left corner, and then add them to your farm. Once you have some animals, you can take the Collect from Animals action. Roll the three animal dice. And for each icon rolled, which matches the icon on one of your animals, take one of the goods tiles that animal produces and add it to the inventory of the player taking the action. Duplicates will combo together efficiently. Here, two cows with two rolled cows will give you a total of four milk. In the mountains you can explore the mine, and this is a good place that you can go to get stone, bug meat, geodes and ore. The mine is divided into 12 sequential levels. At the top the mine is relatively safe, there are no nasty enemies that will harm you. But there's only copper ore and basic geodes available. When you get down to the very bottom of the mine, the monsters are a lot nastier, but all of the ores and geodes are available. When you explore the mine, roll two of the Stardew dice. Then use those dice as coordinates on the grid from the map card to determine what you've found. You can choose either permutation of the coordinates, so here you could have found some bug meat, or if you swap the coordinates this way, then you would have found some ore. With this icon, you can choose any ore matching your current level. Similarly, if you roll a geode icon, then you can choose any geode which matches your current level. You may find stone, which you take from the supply. And note that stone is the only one of the resource tiles which is considered unlimited. You should use a substitute if you run out. If you roll a skull, you encounter the monster's effect which, once again, is positive at level 1, but gets worse as you go down into the mine. You may find an item, in which case you would draw a card from the item deck and add it to your inventory. Or you may find a mine event, in which case you would draw the top card from the mine event deck and resolve that. These are all positive. You will generally want to descend in the mine, for a number of reasons. If you want to upgrade your starting tools, the higher upgrades require the sorts of ore you can only get deeper in the mine. Some objectives might force you to go deeper. One way to descend is to find a staircase when you're doing your mine exploration. But a more common way is to spend stone to build stairs as an end of turn effect. To do this, spend a number of stone equal to the number of players to descend one level, and you can do this multiple times as part of the same end of turn effect. However it happens, each time you descend a level, remove the top card from the level deck, revealing your new challenge, and remove the current map card, replacing it with the next one from the top of the deck. As soon as you reach level 12, you find one random epic item as a reward. You can still take Descend actions, but from that point forward, all it will do is change the map card. A player with an upgraded pickaxe starting tool has extra mining flexibility, getting extra choices for any non-monster die roll. With this copper pickaxe, for example, either of these two rewards would be available. 
while with this Iridium pickaxe, any of the nine options could be chosen. Once you've collected geodes in the mine or elsewhere, you can take an action to visit Clint and open as many geodes as you'd like from your inventory. For each geode, roll one die and then consult the geode table. Here a basic geode with a Junimo would give you a copper ore, so you'd discard the geode and replace it with that ore. The rewards gained for the geodes found further down the mine will be better and richer. Stardew Valley has three good spots for fishing, the river, the lake and the ocean, and each is represented by its own geometric shaped icon. A fishing action works the same way in all three locations. First check your location and check which fish on the fish track correspond to that location. These are the ones available for this action. Now roll the three Stardew dice. You may catch any combination of this location's fish whose costs you've rolled. Each die can only be put towards a single fish, so your options here would be to use the two hearts on the brim, or one on the sunfish, and these two on the salmon. Take the caught fish into your inventory. The player with the upgraded starting fishing rod will have the opportunity to re-roll some dice when fishing. Some fish are caught with a crab pot rather than a rod, and these are indicated by this icon in the bottom left corner. To catch one of these in your location, spend one bug meat. So here I could spend two bug meat to catch both of these. This is done in addition to your die roll, so had I rolled these, I could also catch the brim in a single action. Sometimes spaces on the fish track will fill up with garbage. And if on any given fishing action you fail to catch a fish, then you can remove one of these garbage tiles, regardless of your location. If you're lucky, you may have a treasure tile pointing at a fish that you catch. When you do, you get to draw one item card as part of the haul. Note as well, there are four legendary fish in the bag, which are represented by this crown icon. They're caught in the same way as regular fish, but they're tougher to catch and they help or may be needed for some of your endgame objectives. You'll always slide and replenish the fish track from your bag at the end of your action. If as part of the season event card you draw the fish move action, then you'll discard the last two fish on the fish track and again replenish from the bag. Any time a fish tile is discarded, for any reason, whether it's dropped off the fish track, sold or gifted to somebody, it is removed from the game, not returned to the bag. The exception is a legendary fish which is discarded from the fish track. This is returned to the bag. That means you'll never lose out on the chance to catch a legendary fish because it was discarded from the track, and your chances of these fish coming out as the game goes on will increase as other tiles are removed. One thing you will need to do to win the game is collect hearts, and there are two main ways to do this. The first is to make donations at the museum. The museum wants to put artifacts and minerals on display. And as a single action, you can donate any number of these tiles to the matching lettered slot. Once a slot is filled, it can't be filled again, so you'll need to go chasing these tiles until you have one of each letter. Some tiles have a question mark, so they can go into any slot in the appropriate column. For each tile you donate, gain a reward of one heart. And each time you completely fill one of the two columns, gain an epic item as a further reward. The other way to gain hearts is to visit Gus at the Stardrop Saloon and make a friend. Draw and reveal the top card from the villager's deck, and then see whether you can make that villager into a friend by giving them a suitable gift. This always involves discarding one tile from your inventory. You can never gift a tile which has this red X icon. And you can never gift a type of tile which that villager hates. Here, Emily hates crops and fish, so neither of these tiles could be gifted. You can gift any other type of tile, and if you do, the team gains one heart. Here, Emily could be given this geode. 
If, however, you give the villager a type of gift which they profess to love, here, for example, Emily loves artifacts and minerals, then the reward goes up to two hearts. So here, by gifting Emily the Jasper, it will be worth two hearts. Whether you gave a one or two heart gift, if the current season matches that villager's birthday season, then you gain an extra heart. The hearts now go into the team's collective supply and the villager becomes a friend to the player who took the action. You can have any number of friends and they can't be traded between players. When the season card triggers a gift ability, your friends give back. Each player chooses any one of their friends and then resolves its gift ability. All non-friend cards with a gift ability also trigger. The last action on the board is to visit the community center, and this is where you reveal and fulfill the bundles that you need to win the game. For a single action, you may reveal and contribute to as many bundles as you wish. To reveal, pay hearts equal to the number of players and flip the leftmost face down bundle face up. You may also spend one heart per player to discard one of the bundles and replace it with another one face up from the same room. You might do this if the bundle you revealed did not match your strategy or couldn't be completed anymore. For example, if spring foraging is revealed and it's past spring and you don't have what you need to complete it. You can then make a partial or complete donation towards the bundle. This one requires one fall foraging tile per player, so you would spend fall foraging tokens until you either had no more to give or had enough to complete it. When you complete a bundle, the room is restored. As a reward, draw one item card and then give it to any player. This doesn't have to stay with the player who took the action. When you finish all six bundles, the prize goes up to an epic item. The bundles come in predictable styles. The crafts room wants forageables or construction materials. The pantry wants farming produce. The fish tank, believe it or not, wants fish. And legendary fish count as wild towards these objectives. The bulletin board looks to help out the villagers with hearts and one of the other types of tiles. The vault needs money between six and 10 per player and the boiler room needs the products of mining. Once you're done with your location actions, but before the next player's turn, you'll return to the farmhouse and choose one of four end of turn effects, resolving that as often as you'd like or can afford. The first we've already seen, building stairs to descend in the mine. You can choose to pet your animals, spend the number of hearts as shown in the top right corner of an animal to flip it over to its happy side. When you collect from this animal, it now produces high quality goods. You can remove Joja tiles. Remember, these irritating tiles make your actions weaker. For each Joja tile you wish to remove, pay either five gold or one heart. Finally, you may upgrade your starting tool. For each upgrade, pay the required cost and discard the top card from your tool deck. There are many different items you can explore during the game, and the only one I'll talk about in this video is the Mermaid's Pendant, as this is the item which lets you marry one of the villagers. To do this, attach the pendant to a villager who is your friend and who can be married, as indicated by this icon. You now have one extra action each turn, indicated by the purple spouse pawn. During the planning phase, when all players are choosing their starting locations, you'll also choose the location for the spouse's action. On your turn, either before you take your first action, or after you've taken your second action, you'll take the spouse's action, before you both return to do a single end of turn effect. When taking this action, the spouse shares your inventory, items and abilities. When you reach the end of a season, follow the instructions on the card before proceeding to the next round. First place new trees and forageables. Remove any of these tiles that are left over from the previous season and replace with the new season as in setup. 
any crops still in your farm from an earlier season are not impacted. These can stay there even into winter, something which will make players of the video game quite happy. Each player then draws two of their profession upgrade cards and keeps one. Your chosen card goes into one of your two profession upgrade slots, and if you choose a reversible card, choose which side is going to be up. You can hold at most two, and must discard one to accommodate the third one if you wish to at the end of autumn. You'll then proceed to the next round. To win the game, complete all ten of the objectives by the end of winter. We've already seen how to complete the bundles. While with Grandpa's goals, the team will need to meet a certain set of achievements, not necessarily make donations. Here, for example, you need to get to the bottom of the mine, or catch a certain number of legendary fish. You can sell them or donate them after catching them, just as long as you've caught them. The objectives are shared. Even though a single player may do the catching of fish or the making of friends, it's the total number of fish or friends that would contribute to these goals. And that's how to play Stardew Valley the board game. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you find this video useful, please help us hit that like button, subscribe and hit the bell, and also comments. Let us know you there. And I'm also on Instagram. Find me there. Comments, suggestions and feedback are all welcome in the comments section below. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed the game. See you next time.